happy to moderate this event uh, on behalf of the Kenya government. My name is Stephen Kinguyu, and I'm honored because there are other people who could have done it better than me, and they are with uh, they are amongst us. So this is uh, an official Kenya government event, of course, in partnership uh, with our development partners, and it's on uh, the topic or uh, the theme implementing the Paris Agreement, and. Uh, Ideally, we focus on Kenya's uh, national enabling environment. And uh, I, I, I want to take this opportunity to welcome each one of us. We have uh, very senior people amongst us, including the panelists, uh, which is uh, who are all very eminent persons in their own right. And even in the audience, of course, uh, including members of our National Assembly and our Senate amongst other senior government officials. So without wasting time, I would want to start inviting the panelists because we know evenings have got their own way of uh, eating on time and uh, destabilizing people. We do not want uh, to spend so much time and uh, make people, our audience, of course, tired for no good reason. So I would want first to introduce uh, our cabinet secretary, Professor Judy Wahungu. She's the cabinet secretary for the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of the Republic of Kenya, and she will be our first panelist. Prior to being appointed cabinet secretary, she was the executive director of the African Center for Technology Studies, ACTS, in Nairobi, Kenya. She has been an associate professor of science, technology, and society in Pennsylvania State University, and she has also served as an energy advisor to the Energy Sector Management Program of the World Bank. In 2013, she was among 26 eminent scientists representing natural, social, and human sciences engineering appointed to a scientific advisory board announced by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So it's my pleasure and honor to invite uh, Professor Judy Wahungu to make the keynote address, and then thereafter I will in introduce the other panelists. Cabinet Secretary, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Honorable Senators, Honorable Members of Parliament, Excellencies, the Deputy Special Envoy of Climate Change in the U.S. Department of State, Mr. Trick Talley, the CEO, Climate and Development Knowledge Network, Sam Bickersteth, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I take this opportunity to welcome you all to this event hosted by the Republic of Kenya and our development partners. To our partners and our guests, consider yourselves for this next few minutes to be in Kenya right now and among Kenyans, even though we're here in beautiful Marrakesh. Today's event focuses on Kenya's enabling environment towards the implementation of the Paris Agreement. The diversity of panelists is a demonstration of the close collaboration we have cultivated with our stakeholders and partners to comprehensively address climate change. As many of you are aware, Kenya is very vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change as manifested through among others, an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like floods and droughts. These events have far-reaching economic consequences across all our sectors. As a result, we are often compelled to redirect our resources to respond to the adverse impacts of climate change. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say that Kenya has developed robust policy and legislative frameworks to address climate change. These include a national climate change framework and policy, a Climate Change Act 2016. The act establishes a high level coordinational, coordinational institutional structure that includes a National Climate Change Council chaired by the president and a climate change directorate as the lead technical arm for climate change coordination in the country. 
It also gives clear mandates and responsibilities to different stakeholders and institutions. Further, the Act makes the mainstreaming of climate change adaptation and mitigation across the different sectors of the economy mandatory at both national and county government levels. Additionally, the Act makes the reporting of climate change response actions support obligatory at all levels to ensure the transparency of action and support. The Act also establishes a framework to recognize and incentivize the efforts and contribution of our non-state actors towards addressing climate change and also makes public participation in climate change mandatory. The Act also establishes a climate change fund as a financing mechanism for priority climate change actions and interventions. Our Climate Change Act builds on the strong technical foundation laid during the National Climate Action Plan, which is now anchored in the Act as a five-year iterative cycle that will inform the mainstreaming of climate change in national and county government planning, budgeting, and implementation. We have also developed a national adaptation plan that outlines the strategic sector adaptation actions. The National Adaptation Plan builds on the adaptation technical analysis reports developed as part of the National Climate Action Plan. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, our NDC was informed by the aforementioned policy documents and plans and is aligned with our national development agenda as outlined in Vision 2030. I would consequently like to reiterate our government's determination to implement both the adaptation and mitigation components of the NDC. This will contribute towards the attainment of our Vision 2030 and the low carbon climate resilient development pathway recommended in our climate change action plan. In a related development, we now have a national implementing entity to facilitate direct access to both the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund. This is demonstration of our readiness to receive and utilize climate finance for the implementation of our adaptation priority actions and also mitigation contributions. Finally, distinguished guests, it is now my pleasure to welcome all of you to this side event. Engage with us fully and let us explore how best we can move forward together in ensuring sustainability for our current and future generations. I thank you. Thank you, Madam CS, for outlining Kenya's uh, endeavor to, uh, uh, endeavors, of course, to achieve, uh, to, to, to address climate change adaptation and mitigation and of course outlining the policy instruments that the country has put in place and how the country intends of course to implement its NDC. Thank you very much. Now, without uh, wasting any further time, I would want to introduce to you our next panelist, Mr. Trig Tali, who is the Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change of the US uh, Department of State. Trig Tali has served as the Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change at the U.S. Department of State since the year 2013. In this capacity, he served as the head of the U.S. delegation during three years of, uh, prepar of preparatory conferences towards uh, the Paris Agreement under the UNFCCC and was a member of one of, of the core negotiating team in Paris, of course, uh, during the negotiations or for the Paris Agreement. He has managed climate change negotiations as well as a range of uh, climate programs at the State Department since the year 1999, serving as a director and deputy director of the Office of the Global Change in the Bureau of uh, Oceans, Environment and Science. Prior to that, he served as lead negotiator for half a dozen air pollution and chemical treaties at the State Department. Mr. Tali is a member 
of the Senior Executive Service. He has degrees from the Columbia University and the University of uh, Virginia. So join me to invite uh, Mr. Tali to the podium. Mr. Tali, please. Um, well, thank you very much. I just realized my bio is almost as long as my remarks. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Um, well, first of all, I want to say um, a few things. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, invited uh, by the minister. I've had the pleasure of visiting Kenya twice and seeing all of the, uh, the, the really hard uh, practical work that they've been doing over the last several years. But I was able to come, I think, in February uh, after the Paris Agreement was signed. And it was quite remarkable how quickly they had moved from, uh, from signing the agreement to looking at exactly what they had to do to fulfill uh, their uh, contributions under it and to also um, begin to develop the adaptation uh, planning processes that the uh, that the agreement envisions, uh, and it it really was uh, quite impressive. Uh, I think that uh, you, what you've seen in Kenya um, is very quick movement uh, from from what we envisioned in Paris into action, and I think it's fair to say that that places Kenya not only uh, as a leader uh, in the region, but also really uh, among. Uh, all the countries of the world. So what I understand is that uh, this comprehensive law on climate change uh, that was uh, uh, signed into law in May is one of the only comprehensive laws uh, on the continent and indeed in the world. So you are to be congratulated for your focus uh, on this. Um, second point I would make is that we've been involved uh, with Kenya through a number of programs uh, over a period of years and I would say that uh, it has been a joint learning process and one that has developed into a true partnership uh, and I think it's fair to say that we have learned as much from them uh, as they from us uh, both in terms of the technical needs and the things that we need to do but also how good collaboration works. Uh, and I want to congratulate your staff and the people who are uh, involved um, in that. And I, I would highlight uh, Juniper O'Neill from our team at USAID, who really has been spearheading uh, the effort that uh, we've undertaken. Uh, and, and I know that uh, she, she considers this partnership to be extremely successful and rewarding. Uh, and it's something that we notice in Washington. Uh, the third point I would highlight uh, is that we are pleased to have been able to support the development of, of these enabling environments in a number of ways. Um, the first is uh, we've been involved since, 1914, since, uh, since 2014 uh, on, on, through AID's Low Emission and Climate Resilient Development Project uh, with Kenya. And uh, through this project, we were uh, very much involved in supporting the development and approval of uh, Kenya's uh, national climate change plan. So uh, we've had a, a hand with you in that. Um, and I know another very good example of the partnership that we've had uh, is through the development of the Community Land Act. And as I understand it, this will be quite a substantial uh, piece of legislation uh, in recognizing, protecting uh, community land rights and management. And I know that that will have a very significant impact uh, if it's done right uh, in helping manage uh, forest and grassland fires, uh, land degradation, and also uh, reforestation, uh, and that it has very ambitious uh, uh, forest conservation and forest in tree cover uh, requirements that have an extraordinary potential uh, to um, make a difference uh, in, in your net uh, greenhouse gas activities. Um, I know also that uh, through our activities we are providing support uh, on greenhouse gas 
inventories, in particular in the agriculture sector, which I know is a very high priority uh, for uh, Kenya. Um, and I think that um, we see that uh, there are opportunities for more uh, collaboration. Um, I know that uh, in the um, in the national greenhouse gas inventory areas, we're looking at uh, new areas for collaboration. Uh, we are looking at enhanced collaboration uh, in the area of uh, uh, land use um, and um, that we will also be uh, enhancing our work to develop analytical frameworks uh, for modeling and tracking impacts of se sectoral climate actions um, as well as other mitigation activities and we will also be looking at our work uh, on uh, adaptation. Uh, finally, I just note that uh, our, our cooperation with Kenya is a part of a significant uh, investment that we have in uh, African uh, climate activities. And we have been involved, uh, particularly under the Obama administration, uh, in working uh, to promote climate resilience. Uh, we, we think we have promoted, we've helped uh, over two million farmers in support of African efforts uh, to achieve the Malabo Declaration goal. Uh, so that 30% uh, of African farmers are resilient to climate risks in 2025. Uh, we've launched the Power Africa, emission, uh, Power Africa initiative uh, with the goal of doubling access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa. And we have a number of projects in Kenya uh, that are designed uh, to help them to uh, improve their grid and uh, bring projects to, uh, to um, uh, uh, to development. Uh, we've also uh, supported, uh, developed multilateral solutions uh, in partnering with a number of countries on climate smart agriculture uh, and many other areas. And so uh, I, I would expect and anticipate uh, that our commitment uh, to the region will continue. Um, and we look forward in not only to working with Kenya and to continuing this very rewarding uh, uh, work that we have together, but also in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Trig Tali, for that uh, very informative uh, statement where you outlined uh, the collaboration between Kenya and the U.S. government, uh, including regional initiatives where Kenya is also participating. So we are most grateful for you having found time to be with us this evening. So the next speaker or the next panelist will be Mr. Sam Bikasteth. Sam Bikasteth is the CEO of the Climate and De Development Knowledge Network, uh, the CDKN. And uh, CDKN, of course, is a global alliance of uh, Southern and Northern organizations delivering innovative solutions for climate compatible development in developing countries uh, since the year 2011. Sam has established CDKN as a leading global multi-donor funded program supporting developing country decision makers through technical assistance, research and knowledge management projects. CDKN was, of course as, as a result provided assistance on uh, climate policies, planning, and finance, climate-related disasters, and international negotiations to over 70 countries. Sam is a director of uh, the Price Waterhouse Coopers, Co sorry, of the, 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 the Price Waterhouse Coopers Sustainability and Climate Change Team. He is also a visiting research associate at the Oxford University and an advisor to the LSE Leeds University Center for Climate Change Economics and the policy, uh, which is the uh, acronym, of course, the uh, triple C E P. And I'm honored to invite or to welcome Sam to the podium. Sam is also a friend and we collaborate a lot through the LEDs pa uh, Global Partnership, the Low Emissions Development Strategies Global Partnership, where he was the 
founding uh, co-chair. So Sam, kindly take uh, the podium. Thank you, Stephen, very much, and very nice to be here. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, good evening, um, uh, Honourable Cabinet Secretary, um, members of Parliament, and friends. It's a very nice metaphor, the idea of being in Kenya, and I, it's a pleasure always to come to a Kenyan side event, because you really feel that. And I was thinking about, here we are in Kenya in uh, COP22, and that's a bit of a metaphor about the, the opportunity we have between the INDC and the NDC process. So we're in Kenya in the international process. We went through a very international-led process last year. Here we are now in the national process in Kenya this evening. And that's great because we moved from, we dropped the I and it's the NDC process. And I think I would like to reiterate my congratulations. And I think Trigg has alluded to this already, to Kenya, to being so well prepared for that moment that Paris, that opportunity that Paris presented with the NDCs. Many of us have, have spent some time poring over the INDCs, and we know that the UNFCCC uh, declined from providing a straitjacket and uh, guidance to that. So they're a, a very diverse bunch, and I think that was probably the right process uh, to, to bring in so much momentum that we saw less than 12 months ago. But you were really well prepared. You'd had a process, and we've been, you know, it's been a pleasure over the last four years to, to play a contribution as CDKN to that process that has led up to, to uh, and culminated at, at national level very much in your Climate Change Act 2016. And I'd like to reiterate my congratulations to Kenya on that landmark legislation, which puts you, frankly, ahead of the pack in many respects. But that didn't just happen overnight, as many of you know. And congratulations to the members of parliament who passionately drove that through many stages of the process over a number of years. It was built on some strong foundations. The National Climate Change Action Plan was one of those foundations. There are others as well, as the Cabinet Secretary has referred to. And we were very happy to be part of the process of pulling that together. The National Adaptation Plan and others were part of that. So I do think uh, you are in a place to do what this COP says on the tin this cop says cop 22 cop of action so are we ready to act i do feel in kenya you seem to be ready to act on the basis of the legal framework the institutional framework that the law has set out uh the analysis on a whole range of issues uh, around mitigation adaptation and finance and so on um and so it seems to me that your ndc is seen as a very robust document, not because, with due respect to the Ministry uh, of Environment and Natural Resources, because it comes from your ministry, but because it's because it's bedded into your national processes, Vision 2030, amongst others that you've already referred to. We were very happy to be part of that process of building up the analysis, the sectoral analysis um, and planning uh, that went into the, the National Climate Change Action Plan and the INDC and some of the consultations have not only with sectors, but also in the county level um, consultations in that. So I, th I do think that provides a robust framework and particularly that bit about the sub-national engagement, where there are many challenges, I'm sure, but respecting your own constitutional developments is, is, is important. Robust technical and political processes, you know, not many countries can say they've got both of those. And I do think that's, that's, that's a fabulous story. But I suppose as we're also we're told by Christiana Figueres when as the ink was drying from the Paris Agreement that the work is just beginning. This is the start of the process. And so we're very happy to continue to work with the government of Kenya to move forward to the implementation phase of your NDC. And we've been developing guidelines with our partners from Ricardo. Um, uh, and we'll be very happy. We'll be working with with your government uh, to 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 take forward these various elements. Many of that is much of that is very self evident, but there's quite a lot to do at once, uh, and I very I guess very little time to do it. The accountability mechanisms with respect to the NDC will kick in at international level. These guidelines set out five key modules: governance, how they're going to govern the process, and you set that out, of course, very clearly in your Climate Change Act of this year, the mitigation aspects, the adaptation aspects, which of course you drew out very strongly 
in your uh, IMDC, not just focusing on your, your good ambitions around 30% reduction against business as usual. So the adaptation, the mitigation, um, the climate finance and the MRV, the measurement uh, reporting and verification. And our guidance also, rather importantly, links this back into the SDG agenda. We must be, be really cautious about uh, staying out of our climate silo and integrating this into national and international development processes. And the SDGs, the global goals, set such a good framework. And I will just preempt the next speaker by saying part of that is gender mainstreaming. And I think we do need to be really careful about the gender uh, uh, dimensions of the implementation of this. We'll be focusing in particular on this, this, this challenging area around measurement, reporting and verification. The US government's already doing a lot on some of the, the GHG's inventory work, but there's an awful lot of work to be done there in building that up. But I guess, to be honest, I think none of this is going to make much sense unless the resources are available. Uh, and we talk a lot about climate finance here in the COP, um, and there are many parts to that. Um, we've been working with not only the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, but the National Treasury um, in pulling together um, proposals to go to the Green Climate Fund um, through the Enhanced Direct, Enhancing Direct Access process uh, for adaptation purposes. I'm very pleased that three proposals have now gone forward to the GCF, and I obviously wish Kenya well with that forward process and success with the GCF. Uh, but we all know that that is going to be insufficient uh, and it's going to be about mobilizing broader resources, not least from the private sector. And so we'll be kicking off some work uh, for some conversations to build that confidence with the private sector itself to mobilize resources to deliver on your climate change ambitions. Um, my last remark uh, is around knowledge management. And I guess I realize why we were all on the panel here this evening. I thought it was a really nice example of collaboration. Kenya is, you know, you're doing some great work on communicating these challenges, and uh, we've all been given this positive narrative around success stories. Uh, and I was just reading the acknowledgements at the back. Uh, and acknowledgements, um, basically, are for all the, most of the programs sitting up here this evening. So it's nice to know that it's not CDKEN doing its own thing, that um, the UK START program the United States um, LECRD program that Triggs already referred to and CDKN itself with UNDP are all acknowledged as contributors to this process. And I think that's great. Uh, and I'm rather glad to see that none of our logos are on, on it. It's, it's, it's led by you. So I know my donor was here earlier, but and he probably will wrap, wrap me on the knuckles to this earlier. Our <laughs> Dutch and British donor colleagues who I do acknowledge their generous support. Uh, but I do think it's great that it's your owned a national process and we're very happy to work in that kind of partnership together and I do think this is the point here is about knowledge partnerships this is about sharing the knowledge we don't have any particular truth in terms of the networks and learning it's been a pleasure to work with Stephen over the years in the LEDS global partnership which is funded by predominantly by the US government and Triggs colleagues but also the UK government um, there are many aspects of knowledge and experience in this in this desire to accelerate action on ND, NDC. So CDKN is very committed to these knowledge type partnerships and a brokering role. There's a lot of soft process around this. This isn't just technical process of inventories. It's around mobilizing leaders, actors at multiple levels to drive this. And I do think you're very, very well placed, um, Cabinet Secretary, to take this exciting challenge forward with the team that you have working with you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam, uh, for those uh, very kind words uh, on what uh, the Minis is doing and for highlighting the collaboration areas between CDKN and the Kenya government. Uh, that's uh, very informative, and I'm sure the, the participants have taken note, and where they have questions, they will, they will, uh, they will of course, uh, post them. So without wasting any further time, I'd want to invite the next uh, panelist. This, uh, the next panelist is uh, Madam Winfred Lichuma, who is the, co the, 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 the chairperson of, the national, of Kenya's National Gender and Equality Commission, which is a 
Constitutional Commission. Winfred Lichuma is the chairperson of the National Gender and Equality Commission. She is a lawyer of over 20 years standing, and previously she served as a commissioner at the Kenya National, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. She also has worked as a practicing advocate and a magistrate of the High Court of Kenya, a position she held for 10 years. Winfred has a wide experience in gender, in gender mainstreaming, and in human rights promotion and programming. And it's also important to mention that uh, uh, Madam Lichuma has also been uh, co-facilitating the gender and climate change uh, agenda item actually in this COP. So we are honored to have you, uh, Madam Lichuma, and I would want to humbly invite you to the podium. Uh, please. Uh, thank you, Stephen, the CS, all the dignitaries, the members of parliament, uh, good evening. I'm humbled uh, this evening and have been requested to talk about the gender analysis of the Paris Agreement and uh, what we are doing as a country. I'm delighted with the previous speakers who have uh, spoken before me. Of course, we all know that uh, the gender agenda has been a long journey to get it into the mainstream of the COPs. Looking at the Paris Agreement, where we all were as negotiators, we found it necessary to have the gender equality language within the Paris Agreement. Now, why is gender important? And why was it necessary for it to be included in the Paris Agreement? And so how do we deal with the sections of the Paris Agreement that do not specifically mention gender? Of course, uh, coming from Kenya, we know the two-third gender rule. And sometimes I walk around and my name now is the two-third gender rule. Because it is so, so important for us to ensure that we include both men and women. Of course, there are areas we've not done very well. But just allow me to say that when we talk about the gender uh, definition, we're looking at the social construction of roles and responsibilities of men and women. And we know that the gender impacts men and women, boys and girls, differently. It also impacts persons with disabilities and other vulnerable groups differently. And thus, it's very important for us as the key body of the government with the mandate to monitor, audit, and mainstream issues of gender to be here talking about gender in climate change. In the Paris Agreement, just to remind you, we got the gender equality and empowerment language within the preamble. And we, having it within the preamble means that the existing obligations by the government are recognized, and therefore, as Kenya prepares to ratify the Paris Agreement, which I hope will be soon, we already are acknowledging that it's an obligation for us to work around inclusivity. And we're talking about social inclusion. We also had uh, gender equality mentioned in the adaptation clause, Article 7. And it talks about parties acknowledging that adaptation action should follow a country-driven, gender-responsive, participatory, and fully transparent approach, taking into consideration the vulnerability of the vulnerable groups. Of course, I will demonstrate how Kenya already is far ahead in terms of what our constitution provides. So gender responsive adaptation means that both men and women should be involved in adaptation planning and interventions should be gender equitable, which may mean different for men compared to women so as not to reinforce the existing inequalities. And finally, we got the gender language in Article 11, capacity building. And implicitly, this recognizes the differential vulnerabilities and highlights the imperative to highlight different capacity building needs for men and women and the importance of responding to them at that gendered level. We failed to get the language into the mitigation. But however, we know that uh, in mitigation, we're talking about agriculture, which is a major source of the African emissions, and women often are farmers. 
mitigation opportunities can benefit both men and women, and women can contribute to mitigation efforts, be it natural resource stewardship, reforestation, agroforestry, without gender responsive mitigation strategies, gender inequality may be reinforced. In aspects of finance and technology, again, uh, both are key to enable adaptation and mitigation, and we need to ensure both women and men's voices are heard and, uh, 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 and when we do our interventions, we take uh, care of them. Therefore, the broader steps we need to take as a country to ensure gender equitable implementation of the Paris Agreement will rely on the domestic legal policy framework we develop as a country. Therefore, we will be assessing the gender differences and establish the baseline situation. We'll also analyze the adequacy of existing policies and strategies with relation to the gender issues. In summary, the gender difference in climate change, adaptation, mitigation, of course, are well known, but failure to include the gender agenda would mean largely it would be very disappointing for us as we implement. Now, what do we have at the country level? We now have the gender integration at the global level. That means in the Paris decision. At the AU level, of course, we know that our heads of state did make a, a commitment. And we currently now have the AUC developing a gender and women and youth program, <coughs> which will go a long way in ensuring this is happening at the regional level. Now, Kenya has policies and a legal framework that is gender responsive. The Climate Change Act 2016 provides the regulatory framework to enhance the response to climate change. And one key thing that keeps running through and through the climate change action is that the climate change issues will be mainstreamed in all government ministries and departments and the devolved level, that means the county government and it's binding to both public and private entities. I will take note of the role that says we must mainstream intergenerational and gender equity in all aspects of climate change response. And to facilitate this, we have bodies that has been established. And if I look at the Kenyan constitution, it does provide for gender equality and inclusion in Article 27, which provides for non-discrimination, and it makes gender one of those areas where one should not disc discriminate. It does also provide for affirmative action, and affirmative action is positive discrimination, where for one gender, especially the female gender that has been left behind, one can easily positively discriminate if you need to bring them to the mainstream. At the leadership level, we have the not more than two third gender role, meaning that in all the actions that require leadership, the two third gender rule must be respected. And we begin with even the cabinet level. We know that we were not able to meet the two third gender rule via third, but we have the cabinet uh, secretaries, 29 being female. And some of the key ministries in Kenya are led by women starting with the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. Our cabinet secretary sitting before you today is female. The woman also heads the Ministry of, um, of uh, Foreign Affairs, among others. So we have women coming onto board courtesy of the two-third gender rule. Now, parliamentary representation, we have not made the numbers. But hopefully, as we go to the election next year, we will be able to translate that into action. Now, we have bodies that have been established to coordinate, to monitor, to audit. The National Gender and Equality Commission, which I chair, is that body that is supposed to give advisory to the government in terms of inclusion. And the special interest groups have been recognized within the Constitution. And these include women, it is youth, children, all the members of society, minorities, and the marginalized. And our role includes monitoring, auditing, and holding the government to account in terms of realization of the gender responsiveness in action. And this includes both public and private entity. 
So when you look at the creation of the National Climate Change Council that is within uh, the law that we now have passed, the president is mandated that when he sets up that body, he must respect the two-third gender rule. So that means at the decision level, we will have women sitting at that council. And the women sitting there is just to make the decision gender responsive. So we are hoping that both men and women who sit at that council would find it necessary to uh, reflect on the commitments Kenya has made. Because one of the roles within the law is that Kenya has ratified several treaties and whose obligations it needs to meet. We know that we've ratified the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Beijing Platform of Action, which all does provide for gender equality. The Climate Change Directorate in its secretariat would also be complying with the two-third gender rule in terms of uh, filling the interdisciplinary uh, persons that are required to work within that framework. The action plan, again, here in setting out the action plan for mainstreaming, the responses will also have to be gendered in terms of the gender dimensions of climate change for both mitigation and adaptation. Therefore, Kenya prides in being one of the few countries that have a legislation. And in my view, the Kenyan legislation is gender responsive in terms of application and in terms of even the resources that would be made available. Because we've gone ahead to provide for a climate fund and the climate fund in terms of its administration, it has set out the rules and the rules must respect the gender in the generational equity in access of those resources. Now, other policy and strategies, Kenya is among the few countries whose INDCs did respect the gender responsiveness. If you check on the uh, UNFCCC website, you clearly would see Kenya listed among those countries that already had a priority in adaptation actions that included gender and vulnerable groups and the youth. And therefore, as we move towards the implementation, we have the structure, we have the enabling environment, we have policies, that are already gender responsive. And we also have set up institutions like the National Gender Equality Commission that is supposed to advise the government in terms of integrating issues of gender and climate change. And therefore, we are happy to take these to the ground to begin to implement the law that is now available and to ensure that we integrate gender within the framework. As I finish, I was able to co-facilitate the gender negotiations, and I'm happy to report that we have gender and climate change text under the SBI. And when we look at the text for Kenya, it would be a walkover because already the policy framework is established. All we'll be required to do is to have a very clear action plan on how we want to do this. And having the policies in place, the strategies in place, and the law in place, I think it will be very easy for us to put our heads together and we will undertake to lead as an advisory body to ensure that we get the gender action plan out of the Paris Agreement and within the legislation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Winnie Lichuma. I think the gender issues cannot be better articulated than that. At least you brought it from the global level, the regional level, and the country level, what Kenya as a country is doing to address uh, gender issues, and especially with respect to climate change. And you brought in very appropriate examples, and we are most grateful for that. I would want to call our next panelist, and uh, this is uh, no other but uh, Madam Deborah Murphy, who is a technical advisor uh, of the DFID program named uh, Strengthening Adaptation uh, and Resilience to Climate Change in Kenya. Plus, of course, because this is the second phase, there was a first phase. and. Um, so Debra is a technical, uh, technical advisor with the STAC program, of course, under the DFID, 
to the government of Kenya. And uh, of course, uh, this is a program funded by the United Kingdom government through DFID, the Department for International Development. Uh, she is also an associate with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the IISD, and an affiliate of uh, Development uh, Alternative uh, Initiative, DAI. She has worked in Kenya for four years on climate change related issues, supporting the government of Kenya on policy issues and enga engaging on the national determined contribution implementation and sectoral analysis of uh, key mitigation sectors. So it's my, my honor to now invite uh, Deborah to the podium so that you can speak to the audience. Um, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here this evening. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be taking part in this panel. Um, honorable members of parliament, honorable senators, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it's a pleasure uh, to be here today uh, on this side event, at this side event on Kenya's enabling environment. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the cabinet secretary and her uh, climate change directorate for the enactment of the Kenya Climate Change Act. Um, this is truly, uh, I think, places Kenya as a leader uh, in establishing an enabling environment and um, I think many people in the room know, but many of you probably don't, the hard work uh, and the number of years that went into getting to this point. Uh, I think the work started back maybe in 2009 even. Um, and um, as I look around the room, I see that there are representatives from civil society, from parliament, from the private sector, from research institutes who all contributed. Um, to developing this act. So the congratulations is, are to the ministry and the cabinet secretary, but to also all of you. Um, without your efforts, uh, I don't think Kenya would be at the forefront uh, like they are today. Um, I think too, um, so Kenya is in, at the forefront uh, in putting forward an enabling environment. This includes the act. This includes the National Climate Change Action Plan. And it includes many actions that are described in the publications uh, that you've received as you've come in the door and that Sam has pointed out. And I think like uh, my fellow development partners, we are you know, very proud to have been part of that and to have worked with the government uh, in, um, this, in establishing this act, establishing the action plan and actually moving forward on implementation. Um, and I think that's partly what those publications try to point out to you that it's yes we have there's an enabling environment but at the same time things are happening and if you look in the success story booklet you'll see that kenya is making great strides for both mitigation and adaptation um, you know for example the standard gauge railway which will move freight from road uh from road to rail you also have um a new national adaptation plan that sets up priority actions in a number of sectors. And I think there's representatives here from the Ministry of Agriculture who are moving forward on climate smart agriculture. So I think the interesting thing, it's uh, you can have a plan, but what's uh, happening in Kenya is that implementation is actually taking place and great strides are being made to move forward. Uh, indeed, one of the things we'll be working with uh, Kenya over the next year is looking at that action plan and trying to determine you know, what was actually done so that it can be revised and um, improved for the next iteration. And I think uh, listening to your comments on gender, I think one of the areas perhaps that we need to improve on um, is the gender. And um, you know, um, look forward to engagement uh, with you as we try to figure that out. Because perhaps that was a bit weak in the first uh, action plan. Um, but uh, I'd say I think the, the act uh, is the cornerstone of Kenya's enabling environment. And it provides a framework that guides us as development partners. Uh, if you look at the act, it sets out areas of priority. 
And you know, those are the areas that we will continue to work with the government on. Now, uh, the program I work for, as Stephen just said, Stark Plus, um, we've been collaborating with the ministry for the past three years and um, our work going for while we've helped to develop the act and the action plan our work going forward is very much focused on implementation so our responsive technical assistance program uh, which is funded by the uk government and implemented by dai and isd i think most of you know isd they're the ones that do the reporting here take the photos <laughs> um, but i say certainly our our consortium is looking forward to working with you to move forward to implementation. Now, an example of the collaboration that we undertake with the government of Kenya is uh, let's, the INDC sector analysis. So we've been working with the government to, uh, and the Climate Change Directorate to unpack the INDC. You know, what does this 30% uh, emission reduction from business as usual mean across the six emitting sectors? So helping to determine what's doable, what's possible, what are the range of mitigation potentials within the various sectors, and helping to identify the priority uh, technologies going forward. We certainly recognize that this will be, we're calling it establishing the evidence base, and then we hope to work cooperatively uh, with other government department, uh, with other development uh, partners to look more in depth in those various sectors because we can have the broad overview, but then you need to go in depth uh, with your sector expertise and each partner brings different expertise to the table. Uh, in working on this sector analysis, we've worked um, very closely with the Climate Change Director, but we've also worked with the Ministries of Agriculture, Energy, Forestry, uh, and Agriculture. So truly, um, when the ministry engages in its planning and implementation, it works very much on a cross-government basis and also down to the county level. Um, this NDC sector analysis is just one example of the work that we do, but I think it's a very relevant example given the discussions that we've heard over the past week, um, two weeks here in Paris, because implementation and action is what is needed going forward. We've also been engaged working with the government on the National Adaptation Plan. We've also done work with, on climate finance, also climate smart agriculture, um, and look forward to moving ahead. Uh, so in closing, I would like to express that the UK government uh, is very pleased to be a development partner with the government of Kenya. And we look forward to continued collaboration with you and with the other development partners and as I say, an improvement in our gender perspective. Um, but I like our panel because we've actually got three women and two men. So that's a, that's a good gender mix, isn't it? <laughs> if Dr. Chimo shows up, we'll be 50-50. But right now, women are a little, little bit ahead. Um, but but uh, as I say, we look forward to, to working with you and with other development partners in a collaborative approach to help Kenya move forward with its NDC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, for those remarks. Uh, I think you are four years in Kenya. I've made you a true Kenyan, and uh, you know Kenya like the back of your hand, don't you? So we are most grateful because of the remarks you made, touching on different areas of collaboration between the UK government and the Kenya government, including, of course, the development of the INDC, the National Climate Change Action Plan, the National Adaptation Plan, and now the ongoing work, of course, to unpack the implications of the 30% uh, mitigation contribution in our NDC at the sector level. And I think I cannot say it any better than you have done it. So we are most grateful. So ladies and gentlemen, because uh, we, according to my estimation, we have just a, just slightly less than one uh, half an hour to be in this room. And uh, I would want to appreciate uh, the statements that are uh able and eminent uh, panelists of course have uh, made and uh, then open the floor for quick uh, points of intervention questions and whatever else that you might want uh, of course uh, clarification about based on the statements by the speakers 
and uh, any other relevant matters. So let me open the floor. I want first to apologize because I know those who have seen the program, we were supposed to have a fifth, uh, a sixth panelist, uh, Dr. John Chumo, to bring the county government. County government are the equivalent of sub-national government systems in Kenya. And uh, unfortunately, he does not seem to be with us, and therefore we want to apologize for that uh, gap. But then, Perhaps it has also saved us a bit of time. So let me open the floor for any quick interventions from the audience. Yes, uh, Margaret, uh, there is one hand. This one. OK, OK, fine. There is a mic. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you, the moderator, for um, uh, the, the uh, cast of very eminent uh, panelists in this signed event. Uh, there is no doubt that um, the cabinet secretary has been a veteran in negotiations, not only this one, but uh, she has been in negotiations since uh, this started. And um, I think she, she, has, she may not be a very excited person because she understands what this means. Um, the, if, I want to make a reference to the uh, when there were negotiations for Kyoto Protocol, and there was one one mechanism which was very exciting to Africans. That was the the, the CDM. I remember that is when I was joining this debate. <coughs> they were the ones who were actually she was in the civil society, and they were the ones who were warning that oh this this uh, this CDM. Let us not be not very excited about it because everybody, African governments were considered, oh, this is a panacea for our development. The civil society was warning about its, uh, its, uh, its, its weaknesses, but they never listened. It. But now you know what the result. Actually, they were predicated. Now we are in another one. This uh, Paris Agreement, we have got the the the, the INDCs, which by the way has now turned into NDCs. So we are not talking about the intention or so. Now, with that, um, the mood here, particularly from African countries, is that we need to, is, there is need to reopen uh, the, these IND, NDCs again because they were done hurriedly. And uh, perhaps some of the countries may not meet even their commitments in uh, particularly africa in mitigation because still these ndcs are mitigation leaning and so the just one question because uh, uh it, it has been discussed and this is a very important uh, tool for moving forward for kenya we is it is there what is the reasoning for kenya is is it just like other countries like we need to reopen if you look at what is required for its implementation is 40 billion by 2030 uh, us dollars that is four trillion kenya shillings and looking at that i've divided it quickly i've seen each each year we require 260 billion uh, kenya shillings so do we have that capacity and we, we do not have and looking at even the, the the game financing game being played here then who, are, who is going to pay for that so that's a question so it's two questions maybe we'll be advised on that then the next question allow me to ask the last one moderator i'm very happy that um mr stack or stick from u.s delegation the deputy uh, uh, envoy. Um, we didn't really. Uh, um, you have talked very well about all oh, the US has helped a lot. And uh, if I have looked at the Green Climate Fund, the US promised 3 billion US dollars. And uh, up to until March uh, um, this year, it, it only uh, delivered 500 million US dollars. So it has not been delivered. And now we are at crunch time. There is a candidate who has won the election, Donald Trump. Throughout his election, he was saying, 
is going actually to nullify what even Obama has done and, uh, and reverse that. So, and uh, when I hear you talking, you say we anticipate that we are going. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty here, actually. So we would really like some, uh, some, some I maybe mean, it may be difficult for you even to answer, as it is for us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really, we are really worried. It's a big worry for us because the U.S. should provide leadership, and we want to really. Uh, um, now is the president. Maybe those who are campaign rhetorics that now climate is not a, 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 a Chinese hoax; it is real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Medica. Uh, ben Son, just next there. Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Benson, and uh, mine is um, uh, to Mrs. Dichuma. I would like you to probably mention something on the human rights, because I understand we are supposed to integrate the aspects of human rights in the climate policies, especially on the issue of migrants. And uh, we only need to, uh, you might be an expert on the issues of gender, but the issues of uh, human rights, especially. Uh, I visited Karamoja region, the Karamoja Peace Cluster, whereby this conflict between, you know, the the communities there because of the, of the land and the diminishing resources, that is water, um, you know, how they migrate based Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya. And so at what point are we going to mention the issues of human rights, especially now climate change is affecting the migrants? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. Uh, any other Yes, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, Senator, Senator Bilo. Sorry, thank you very much. I want to appreciate the good work um, that has been done uh, in Kenya by the different um, uh, institutions. I just wanted a, a bit of a clarification. I, I don't want to sound skeptical, um, but I, I represent one of the 24 arid and semi-arid counties in Kenya that are uh, today experiencing a very severe drought. In fact, early today, the uh, governors representing some of those counties uh, urged the government to declare a national emergency because there's a crisis. My own county, Mandera, um, today in two sub-counties, one of them just an hour ago, I was told the only water pan serving the main town of the south county has dried up with a crisis but early today also another south county uh, takaba also dried up so i'm just wondering on this uh, the action plan for ending drought emergencies program which should kick in according to the strategies that i've seen here by 2022 we're in 2017. i just wanted um a bit of um, guidance on how what exactly this action plan um, entails, um, uh, given the fact that even as the emergencies and the drought is biting, um, it appears the planning by the relevant um, uh, ministries uh, had not been done. And in fact, as I speak, the first consignment of relief food to that particular county, for example, the one that I represent, is yet to arrive. Even as you know, it. So I'm just wondering with the, all the early warnings and all that, what, what exactly is the action plan for ending the drought emergencies by 2022? Um, that aspect of it is what I wanted some clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, anyone from this side? I'll come to you, madam. Anyone from this side? Because I think it's like this, uh, the left side. Uh, I, I, I don't know what's uh, the issue. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> And then I will come to you, madam. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Michael from uh, Safaricom. And uh, thank you very much, uh, the speakers, for the wonderful insights that we've had um, and what Kenya is doing and what the, our development partners have been doing um, to support our journey on uh, climate change uh, adaptation and, and mitigation. My question goes to um, the ministry, uh, the CS. Uh, having interacted with the Kenyans who are here um, the whole week last week, I think there is um, very little representation from the private sector, and I believe they have a key role in terms of uh, implementing and, and having the strategies and, and action plans, including the financing in, in terms of um, 
adaptation and mitigation. But I'm not sure whether there is um, a real drive from, from the ministry or the government to actually uh, rally private sector. Because I know, I know there is, um, th there is very little awareness, I, I believe, uh, within the private sector. And, and, and they, 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 I think they, that needs to be pushed a bit so that um, we can actually have them um, rally behind all the strategies that the government uh, uh, have been doing. Uh, early today, actually the whole day today, there was um, at the, at just the, the room opposite us on Atlantic. There was a lot of discussions from private sector, the role of ICT in uh, mitigation and adaptation of climate change. And I could see several organizations, including um, several organizations actually participating. And most, some of the examples that were given were actually that we, uh, what we do in Kenya, uh, Safaricom being one of them, and PESA was given in, uh, as an example in a number of, of them. But I still think um, the, the, the awareness among us, the private sector in Kenya is low, and we need to probably do more on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Coach from Safaricom. Uh, Madam Greenbelt, I, yep. Yeah, I, thank you very much. Actually, I had nothing to say. I was just worried that the ladies <clears throat> are a bit quiet, so I thought maybe a voice <laughs> of the ladies uh, should be heard. But now that I have the mic, I just wanted to say congratulations to the Cabinet Secretary and actually to all the players, but to just say that... Um, um, we are hearing good things, excited, we are delighted, and to say that this is the beginning for our country, and we want to see now action. We hope that everybody will be involved, and to remind the cabinet secretary and everybody else in the whole government that the people must be involved, that this must be a people-driven um, implementation, because if people are not involved, it's not going to succeed. And to also talk to our friends from the U.S., and uh, the UK to say that we need your support. We are happy and we get very excited that you're congratulating us, but we need you to work with us through this journey because we are just beginning. And to move forward, we need your support and we need you to work with us and that the people must be involved. The communities must be involved. The people must speak. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question so that we can have at least a at least 10 minutes for the panelists to react from to the questions uh, from the floor. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Eva Sufin. I represent the Green European Foundation. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, uh, the man before was asking if the private sector was involved in uh, your projects. And uh, my question is, uh, do you, will you support the community management of water? We were speaking about drought, about the problems of water, and uh, we know in a modern economy that uh, uh, the economy managed by the communities, the commons, is one of methods to uh, manage the resources for future generations, maintaining the resources for future generations. So are you thinking, do you have traditionally this kind of uh, uh, self-management of resources like water by the communities and are will you support this kind of initiatives thank you very much that's the last question so that we save a bit of time so i will invite uh, each uh, of the panelists to react to any of the questions uh, any of the questions uh, the choice is yours because you know what most uh, relates to your docket and domain and of course, uh, of course, not necessarily just the statement that you made. So I will just start with the. I will start now from Deborah coming this way. I will end up with the cabinet secretary. Deborah, please. Um, just briefly um, to respond to a couple of the questions, I thought the remark about the NDCs was rather interesting. Is there a need to reopen? And there has been some discussion that many African countries perhaps were a bit too ambitious with their mitigation targets or their adaptation targets, and perhaps they need to be revisited. Um, I think from Kenya's perspective, um, the initial analysis that we're undertaking with the ministry on the NDC shows that Kenya can achieve that target. Um, it, it is it is doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. And I think if you read the uh, INDC carefully, it is a conditional target. 
uh, recognizing that for Kenya to achieve this, it requires support from development partners. So it, it is doable, but I think importantly, it's doable with support. But that that uh, analysis that we're working on will 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 flesh out more of the details. But but I do agree that perhaps. Uh, for some other countries, it might be quite difficult to, to achieve a very uh, ambitious, maybe overly ambitious target. Um, in response to um, the last two questions about, you know, the people must be involved, what are you doing at the natural resource level? I didn't go into detail, but, but our different program uh, cuts across many um, sectors. So, for example, CAM is engaged as a partner and they're doing a, fair, a lot of work on energy efficiency and trying to build up the capacity of um, industry within Kenya. We also engage with ACT, a civil society group that does natural resource management uh, with, the, uh, um, with various civil society organizations. We also, and I think the Kenya Climate Innovation Center is re represented here tonight, looking at technology innovation. And then the ADA Consortium is looking at uh, community-based adaptation in, in many of the ACEL counties. Uh, so there is a lot more going on than we just, we just touched on stuff today. And I suggest you take a look at the, some of the materials that go into some um, detail. And, um, uh, Senator, I don't know if I, I, I don't think I can actually respond to your question, but I, I must say that DFID ha does provide support for the Hunger Net Safety Program, early warning systems. Um, I'm not one to take decisions, but I think that perhaps more needs to be done because there is a, as you say, a, a real emerging crisis uh, within Kenya and many counties. And um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is, but um, we'll certainly take the messages back to. Um, to the to different people that uh, that support is needed and uh, perhaps should be strengthened thank you thank you deborah i, I think that's very articulate uh madam lichuma yeah allow me to take uh, the two questions one on human rights and the other was on uh, participation indeed uh the paris agreement in the preamble does recognize human rights as a key uh entry point and uh, we're looking at the issues of land as a whole and uh, i believe uh, that is one of the key areas uh, the ministry has focused on in the in the policy document and uh, again when you look at um, both the paris agreement does recognize other international treaties so generally even if it's not uh, outrightly mentioned in all the sections, uh, Kenya has ratified various treaties that do provide for the, 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 the right to land, access land. Uh, Kenya also has uh, a decision from the African uh, Commission in terms of what the role should be uh, with indigenous communities. And I think uh, it, is, uh, it is within the Kenyan mandate to ensure that these issues are brought on board. And uh, apart from the National Gender and Equality Commission, we have the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights that has really, really been into the case of the Endorons. And I believe the question you put on the table is, is uh, for the Karamachong community is quite, quite uh, similar to the ruling that we already have from the African Commission that is at the implementation stage. So I think we can engage to see how that gets to apply to the other communities. But I think we cannot separate the issues of the right to land from the issues of climate change. That becomes part and parcel of what we look at, We're talking about land, education, health, the ability of these communities also even to participate in decision making. And that now gets me to the level of the, the right to participate. Participation has been recognized as a right within the constitution. And the Climate Change Act does make reference to Article 10 of the Constitution. And Article 10 does refer to the, uh, the values Kenya puts forward. And among those values is the transparency, accountability, sustainability, human rights, and the issues of the right to participate. And I think uh, it then uh, will take all of us as Kenyans to seek, to want to uh, implement what is in the constitution and what is in the climate act uh, as 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 expounded on 
in terms of the policy that exists. And uh, clearly, as uh, my sister here indicated, that the policy might be a bit weak in some of those areas. And as we now begin the process of review, those are some of the areas I think we need to flag out and see how we mainstream and how we bring them uh, on board so that no one is left behind because we just ratified the SDGs. And remember, the SDGs is that nobody is left behind. And I think we will do much if we ask ourselves questions. Where are we? We take a baseline. Who has been left behind? Why have they been left behind? What can we do about it? And who is it that can do something about it? I think in terms of uh, participation, participation can also pa be passive. But I think we are looking at meaningful participation. How do we get all the communities participating? and the participation that is meaningful. What I like about the environment set in Kenya, we have many oversight bodies, starting from parliament. One who is not satisfied can still go to parliament. If you're at the county level, you can go to the Senate. And the parliament has been very able and willing to intervene in some of those circumstances. And uh, the legal framework of Kenya, we now have the environmental court, again, which can take on those matters. And when you exhaust the domestic remedy, again, at the human rights level, one can go to the African court, one can go to the human rights bodies. So clearly, we are seeing a range of, of, of accountability mechanisms that are open to Kenyans to engage. And I think that is the starting of being uh, quite transparent and being accountable in terms of what, as a country, we get to commit on at the international level. Now, for the private entities, I think, again, uh, when we look at the Constitution, it has application to all individuals, all Kenyans, both public and private sector. And it's important that you're raising a very key uh, point that private sector needs to be at the table because that is where most of the engagement uh, does take uh, place. And therefore, for us as a commission, we already have begun to audit some of the private entities, including Safaricom, which we already audited, but this was just at the decision-making level. And I want to encourage the ministry, maybe what we need to do, because at the performance contracting level, indicators are agreed on, and ministries, departments, county governments <coughs> report. The National Gender and Equality Commission does receive the reports from everyone in terms of gender dimensions. Maybe then, as we get to the next year, we need to coil out gender and climate change indicators that will also be included in terms of reporting for both public and private entities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winnie. I think that's a very comprehensive sum. Yes, um, although I've made many visits to Kenya over the last 25 years, I've, I'm not an expert on the country, so please bear that in consideration in, in, in my response. But I think it's, it's true to say that climate change exacerbates existing economic and social inequalities. And I think the, some of the comments from the floor reflect those challenges that exist uh, right now. This is absolutely clear. And that's why these negotiations and your own commitment to act on climate change is, is, is so very important. Um, uh, and that response requires, uh, to respond to that requires uh, engagement at multiple levels. Um, and that is why I think the community response is particularly important. We have invested a lot in our work in CDK in a very participatory approach in all of the work we're doing in supporting policy development and where we can, uh, bringing in consultations at multiple levels. Well, that's because to build the resilience of society um, and uh, individuals, it's, it's, much, it, it's, it's, a, it's a change of behavior, uh, whether it's uh, changing um, response to our own use of energy or building our attitude to managing risk in a different way. Uh, and so we had to really get away from talking about climate change and just making it the norm that is, this is mainstreamed. I think this is particularly interesting in the private sector and, and, and you know, I think our comments from our friend from Safaricom are important. It's the same in the UK where I come from. I mean, many businesses don't get this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There are a few businesses like yours who appreciate the new risks. So we need to get to a point where it is normal for climate change risks to be incorporated alongside other risks. And that fact into, factored into investment decisions um, and the costs around that and the same for policies across government. I think the NDC provides a great starting point for that, but as several uh, have said, this is just the beginning. 
So in terms of our own work, uh, a modest contribution we'll make next um, in the next few months is to try and get uh, yourself and others together to, to, to address this issue about um, stronger private sector engagement in this discussion and, and leveraging finance of the private sector to tackle these problems. But at the heart, it's not just about introducing a climate model to this, it's about actually making a change of behaviour in the way we make decisions about investments, whether they're public or private. We're starting to see that happen uh, in Kenya and other countries, uh, but I think we have a long way to go. Thank you very much, Sam. That's uh, very articulate. It's a treat. Well, let me start with the easy answers first. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, so So, my, I operate kind of at the 10,000 foot level uh, in the negotiations process and overseeing some of our programs. Uh, the one thing I will say is that uh, we are very focused on mobilizing private investment with our public investments. And so, for example, uh, in, in the Power Africa program, uh, what we do is uh, support projects through financing grants, technical assistance, and investment promotion. Uh, and our goal uh, in Kenya is to mobilize more than $1 billion um, in projects, uh, mostly geothermal and wind. Um, I also have spent a lot of time this year, uh, as has this, most of the senior team, uh, talking to the finance com uh, community uh, following the Paris Agreement. And uh, it is quite striking how much attention uh, we've gotten from private finance who was not focused on, uh, on, on the climate space uh, before, but now sees opportunities largely as a result of this broad commitment uh, to um, uh, to NDCs in all regions. Uh, and so we've talked to institutional investors, uh, to large uh, private uh, banks and uh, investment companies um, about uh, the things that they see as opportunities, development of the green bond market, uh, the development of more national green banks, better vehicles and better transparency for risk reduction and uh, the uh, uh, for understanding and communicating climate risks to investors. Uh, so there's a lot more going on in this space. Uh, and I think there's also a commitment now among uh, the donor community to see how we can organize ourselves better uh, so that we can take advantage of this uh, and so that we can better catalyze uh, the public finance that we have uh, to leverage a lot more uh, private investment in all parts of the world, uh, including Africa. Uh, I do think that Power Africa, which is more focused on energy access, which of course is an you know, incredibly important objective in Africa, is kind of at the vanguard of the kinds of things that we see potentially occurring uh, in the climate space. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, I'd note as well, we do do uh, a lot of water investment uh, in Africa. Um, I think uh, what the, the numbers that I have is that over the last uh, six years, we've provided uh, some 860 million to improve water access for 7.8 million people. Now, I understand that the challenges are ever greater um, and uh, uh, that leads to my third point, um, and that is we did just have an election, um, and uh, so there will be a question about what our climate policy is going forward, uh, and that's very much an issue for the next administration to take up. Uh, I guess, um, so this is, I'm, I'm here representing President Obama, um, and uh, uh, President Obama's commitment to this uh, agenda has grown enormously over the last eight years, uh, and I think it's fair to say it's become one of his highest priorities. And if I could make a personal observation, it is that uh, I've had served a number of presidents, and in, in each case over the course of an administration, the focus and prioritization of this has evolved so that it's become higher and higher. And I think that, you know, that's frankly, because uh, the United States has such a, a 
a large capability to assess the science and the science is pointing to the fact that we have an urgent and uh, remarkably large problem uh, and that apparatus will be here for the next president uh, and I imagine uh, that uh, that um, you know it will have an impact um, I think some other things as, as we leave uh, as President Obama leaves uh, uh, this um, his presidency for the next presidency um, we also see other things that uh, leave this issue uh, in um, in a good place. Um, the first is uh, the strong commitment that countries from all around the world uh, have to address this issue. And Kenya is a very good example of the serious nature of efforts that countries are making to respond to this threat. And I think you, you are a model country, but you are far from the only country. Um, the second is uh, the remarkable uh, evolution uh, in the in the market case for acting, you know, the business case for acting. Uh, we've seen a remarkable transformation in the availability and cost of clean energy, and it has shown that investment in uh, energy, uh, no matter what the source, and in related technologies uh, can have an impact. Um, now, in many of parts of the world, we are finding uh, that the cost of re renewable energy uh, uh, as a function of, uh, uh, you know, cents per gigawatt hour are, or cents per megawatt hour are cheaper than fossil fuels. And that's a, that's a true game changer. Uh, and uh, the cost of, the cost of renewables is going down almost monthly. So as long as that continues, uh, there is a case that um, that uh, this is a, you know, that we have a set of actions that's very much in countries' in interest with respect to sustainable development, uh, whether or not we have this uh, existential climate threat. Another reason is that everything that we do in the development space that relates to climate uh, has other sustainable development benefits, many of them quite profound. Uh, and I think that it's true uh, in the energy space where Power Africa, for example, is focused on providing energy access uh, for the continent, but it's gonna have an enormous benefit as well uh, for climate change. Um, on, in the land use and agriculture sector, uh, there are enormous benefits for forest conservation, uh, for sustainable livelihoods, um, and uh, and and uh, for um, sound agricultural practices over time. And those will have substantial economic benefits as well as environmental benefits. And then finally, on the adaptation side, virtually everything we are doing. Uh, has near-term benefits uh, for, for communities and societies in the form of enhanced resilience against uh, extreme weather events, which have been with us uh, forever, uh, but which are now happening more often. So the case for uh, investing in this is higher. So, so I think that uh, there's, there are, are a, a great number of arguments that make uh, action on, com on climate change compelling. And um, you know it's up to the next uh, administration to decide how they uh, will address those. But um, uh, we will, you know, I'm sure that the president will work uh, to make the transition as effective uh, as possible. Finally, I just wanted to address the GCF because uh, you raised that. Um, our GCF pledge will be affected through uh, multiple years. That's how we planned it when we uh, made the pledge. So uh, the 500 billion is the first year of our pledge uh, and it will be up to the next administration uh, to determine how it will carry that out. Um, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Trigg, for that enlightenment. Uh, we have actually overshot our time and uh, I would, uh, for that reason, invite the cabinet secretary to make closing remarks and uh, dismiss us uh, from this forum. Cabinet secretary, please. Thank you. I will not 
make closing remarks, what I will respond to is the notion that has been presented here that the private sector and the government do not work closely uh, together. If anything, I wish to argue that this particular administration works very closely with the private sector. First of all, we meet quarterly, that is the Kenya Private Sector Alliance and the executive arm of the government. We meet quarterly. These meetings are chaired, are co-chaired by the president and the chair of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Then we also have various committees of the CAPSA and the government. So for example, we also have an environment committee, again, co-chaired by myself, the cabinet secretary for environment and the chair of the environment committee of CAPSA. And we meet monthly. When we were strategizing on the INDCs and what it is that we could deliver, this was hand in hand, not only with the private sector, but also with NGOs, the civil society, and so on. So we do work very closely together. Going further, when it comes to the climate, uh, the Kenya Climate Change Council, there is one slot specifically for the private sector. So I just want to argue that we work very closely uh, together. That has been the tradition that has been set. And uh, if I look at Safaricom itself, it's one of the most active members. Not only when you look at the CSR projects that Safaricom has set up in terms of combating drought with all the water projects, again, hand in hand with other NGOs and with the government, we work very closely. If you look at innovations that Safaricom has come up with, like MCOPA, again, that's hand in hand with the government. So I argue that we're working extremely closely with um, the, the, the private uh, sector. When it comes to a comment that Aisha made about people being involved, again, this particular administration is aware of that. Uh, if I look at my particular ministry, the strides that we have been able to make in the last three and a half years that have actually been record breaking, it is unheard of in the Kenyan government that we have come up with the legislations. First of all, the Wildlife and Conservation Management Act that had been stuck for 20 years, we achieved this in six months. We've had the Forest Act, we've had the Water Act, the Climate Change Act. All of this is because it has been people-driven and people-centered, and we then, as the government, uh, decided all we have to do is listen to the people and act. We've been very open uh, about uh, doing this. We appreciate very much the watchdog role that the civil society uh, plays in our country because it allows us to be active and to be uh, responsive. So Stephen, I'm not going to make closing remarks. I just wanted to assure uh, the, the, <laughs> the participants here that we have strived to work very, very closely with the private sector, but also with political leaders and with civil society. And it has been very healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Cabinet Secretary. That's very helpful. Uh, and I cannot say anything about what you have said. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me uh, to thank our panelists. They have uh, been very resilient. This was a long session and they have been also very articulate in the issues that we are tackling. And I think we, you all agree with me that we need to give them a round of applause for their very, very good uh, contribution towards the success of this uh, side event. And then lastly, to all of us, I think uh, the, the, the numbers have not gone down uh, late like this. You would normally expect uh, people not to be so much interested in uh, science but in other matters. And therefore, I would really want to thank each one of you and uh, ask you again to clap for ourselves for being very good, uh, a very good audience. Thank you for honoring us uh, by coming to this side event. Have a good evening.
and have a, a good time the rest of the time that we are here at COP22. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there are, there, are, there are flash disks with the success stories that Kenya, uh, of course, they would want to share with other participants from other countries and other institutions, and therefore you can pick them by the door as you walk out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yes. We are honored, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.